complicated, you know, man. I got down Rubik's Cube, man. You like talking about that blue red, man. Then you get to one side, then like man. If you share my lack of faith in our health system, you should take control of your well-being. Building resilience and maintaining good health for the long term needs to be a priority. Axios Remote Fitness Coaching offers one-stop expert advice on training, diet, and lifestyle. You can purchase customized workout plans for strength training or structured exercise. If you're serious about maximizing your potential, you can book time with a coach or customize your routine and get video feedback on your performance. I know the owner, and he's one of us. Visit Axios and support those who support the show. Follow the link in the description to become a man of action with Axios. No one blames you for being weak, but it's your fault if you stay that way. All right, John Harris, welcome to the Jay Burden Show. How are you doing, man? Hey, Jay. Uh, doing well. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm glad to have you on. I've uh, it is it is somewhat rare uh, that I have someone on my show who uh, my friends and family have recommended to me. Right, like most of these, most of the people I find on the internet through my own research, and actually, my mother-in-law, you know, showed me your podcast and recommended you as a, as a possible guest, and you know, I found out that we have some some friends in common. So it seemed like it was kind of a uh, meant to be, so to speak. Awesome, yeah, yeah. I'm grateful to your mother-in-law. That's great. So that actually uh, brings us to kind of the start of this, which is, could you describe, you know, kind of briefly, you know, who you are and what you do on the internet? Yeah. So on the internet, this is. I, obviously where most people know me from is my podcast conversations that matter. I, uh, talk about mostly evangelical related issues concerning social justice incursions. I've gotten into some other things as well. And lately I think I've been focusing a little bit more on politics in general and just, uh, unconventional approaches to the political situation we find ourselves in. So it, since it's my podcast, I can talk about what I want, but I, I would say that, um, over the last few years, I've mostly focused on evangelical related uh, things. And I've written a few books. Those are online. Uh, you can find them. You can go to my website, johnharrispodcast.com. And uh, there's two books on social justice for sale there. And um, yeah, I'm trying to think. I've, I've done a few documentaries. I uh, produce documentaries with Last Stand Studios. We're in the middle of uh, doing a few of those right now. And yeah. So uh, to, the, the only other thing I guess to mention is uh, we just started launching uh, a website, truthscript.com, which is kind of like our answer to the Gospel Coalition, which for those who don't know, is a, a more left leaning evangelical uh, website. And um, that's getting some good traction. And we're on the ground floor at this point, but i um, excited about the possibilities there. So for people who aren't kind of in in the scene, when you say evangelical, what do you mean? Because I think for many <laughs> yeah. people, right, that that kind of, you know, brings up an image of, you know, George Bush, Jesus camp, you know, kind of you know, foaming at the mouth, you know, Southern charismatic Christians. So when you say that, what are you referring to specifically? I'm talking about foaming at the mouth, George. No, um, <laughs> I, I realize that is the stereotype and, and, and maybe there's a little bit of merit to, to that to some extent. I mean, usually you go back to the religious right, Jerry Falwell, Pat Robertson type stuff. Um, there's, there's theological evangelicalism, which, uh, I would subscribe to. And I think, uh, any, um, any Christian really should, uh, and that would involve, uh, as the name implies evangelizing, um, uh, certain orthodox doctrines uh, like the divine, the, the divinity of Christ, the Trinity, um, the nece necessity of faith in Christ uh, for salvation. So, um, so there's theological beliefs that come with this. But when I talk about evangelical, oftentimes on the podcast, I'm talking about groups of people in, frankly, industries in um, that buy books from certain publishers like. Lifeway or uh, uh, Nav, Nav Press or something. Um, they are there's certain institutions that are considered evangelical, like um, Crew or um, Nav, Navigators would be another one. Uh, InterVarsity. Um, these are all college related evangelical organizations. Uh, they're all parachurches, really. They they're, they're meant supposedly to assist the church. I don't know how many of them actually do, but. That's the idea. Uh, denominations like the Southern Baptist Convention is evangelical. Um, 
when it comes to denominations, generally evangelical is contrasted with mainline denominations, most of which have gone pretty liberal and denied some orthodox doctrines. So like the PCUSA would be a mainline denomination. Evangelical would be, um, actually, I think the United Methodists are considered evangelical. Um, a lot of them came out of the revivalist movements. So I realize this is overwhelming for, for, and I could probably talk all day about trying to define just what an evangelical is. But um, I think for, for simplicity's sake, for the sake of your audience, uh, it's, it, it's mostly like organizations that have come out of the revivalist eras uh, up until, you know, I guess, post-World War II. Um, and institutions, seminaries, denominations, associations, mission organizations, all of these different outlets that are supposed to be sharing the good news of Christ, and they are all on the same page as far as what that means. Um, those organizations, I think, have been a bulwark, at, at least the members of those, I shouldn't say the organizations, but the members of these organizations have been somewhat of a bulwark against the degradation of our society. They're really the conscience of America. They live in the Bible Belt primarily, and um, they've they've been undergoing for the last few years, at least, I, I think, a transformation from the social justice movement has really invaded these places, and um, it, it's leading to uh, it, it's really leading to people leaving evangelicalism because it's an off ramp from it, but also to people staying in evangelical organizations, but then changing their beliefs and, and sometimes in such a way that it challenges theological evangelicalism, which I described before. So it, it's a real transformation that historians years from now are going to look back at and they're going to probably say, this is where evangelicalism stopped being evangelicalism, or, or they'll say that this, there was a detour that was going on. There was a split that was happening during the time that we're living right now. Um, but I, I think it's important enough to look at these holdouts, these this bulwark uh, from uh, of modernity. I mean, really, you see all these other mainline organizations that were Christian go down the road of social gospel. Even the Catholic Church has um, they have a woke pope now, pretty much. They've gone down these these roads and evangelicals have been the holdouts. They've been the more populist uh, version of Christianity. And and now they're starting to go down the same path. And so um, we're living through history, and I've documented some of this. I've tried to hold the line, as it were, as much as possible. Um, but yeah, hopefully that makes sense of what evangelical is. So if you could, could you describe sort of the issues at hand? I, I know you've said, you know, social justice, and obviously that that has a certain set of connotations. But what are the the, the main fracture lines through the evangelical movement? Yeah, there's a lot of them right now. Um so, I mean, evangelicals typically would fight over things like Calvinism and Arminianism, uh, cessationism and continuationism. These are certain theologies regarding like continuationism that the certain gifts like speaking in tongues continue to today and other evangelicals say, no, they don't. Um, so there were always these divisions and sometimes you would see them in denominations where some denominations believe certain uh, things about the Bible and interpreting it. But they were all secondary matters. They all agreed on the core uh, issues of the divinity of Christ, the Trinity, uh, by grace through faith for salvation, uh, the infallibility of the word of God. That's a key um, feature of evangelicals. Uh, so, so there was this solid theological core that existed. And um, what happened, I think, in 20... Now, this, this actually goes back before then. I wrote a book, Christian, or Social Justice Goes to Church, where I actually traced this starting more during the new left movements of the 60s, but but it didn't really hit mainstream evangelicalism, the, the new left stuff, until I would say really 2014, 2015. There, there's exceptions. You had like InterVarsity going what we now consider to be woke, but they they went that direction probably in the 80s, uh, maybe even in the 70s. Um, but a lot of the main evangelical organizations did not go that direction until fairly recently. And um, there's a whole host of doctrines that the social justice movement, which is a broad movement, challenges. Um, you can see it with the denominational meetings that just happened. You had the Southern Baptists fighting over women pastors last week at their annual meeting. You had uh, the Christian Reformed Church, and I don't actually know that they're considered evangelical. They're, that's kind of on the fence as far as whether they are or not. They're, um, but anyway, I mean, 
I, let's, for the sake of argument, say they're in the evangelical uh, um, uh, movement as well. They were arguing last week over homosexual marriage and whether the church could uh, sanction that. You have the PCA, Presbyterian Church in America. They met last week. Um, I don't think they passed anything significant, but there's always talk at those meetings about same-sex orientation or traction, whether that's permissible or not. Uh, you have the Me Too movement uh, that's in both the PCA and the SBC. You have the Methodists. They just split over homosexuality. And and so um, so these social movements are now coming into the church, these political movements that are really more, I've argued social justice is more of a religion. And, and they're invading these places where they weren't, were not welcome before, but now they are welcome, at least in some quarters. And uh, they're wreaking, they're, they're ha having their way. They're, they're doing a lot of damage. They're um, convincing people to throw out certain portions of scripture or interpret them differently in such a way that would render the whole document uh, or the whole book really um, nonsensical. Because if you can, um, when Paul says things like, you know, cl very clear statements about the role, uh, gender roles and things like that, if you can just throw that out, then you can really throw out anything. And that's part of the problem is, the people who go down this path end up becoming ex-evangelicals much of the time, and they start deconstructing everything. Um, they, they start realizing things like, well, if you reject um, a hierarchy or patriarchy, or um, if you reject the, uh, I guess, objective truth and these kinds of things, then you're going to end up realizing that the religion that you've been planted in and you've been in for years actually agrees with those things. There was a, a recent article from a, I think it was a MSNBC anchor who went to Tim Keller's church. Tim Keller was a big evangelical Presbyterian. He died recently, but he wrote a lot of books. He's very influential um, and very much um, a social justice guy. And so she, this news anchor writes this article about how she was atheistic she rejected the, the, I guess it was some kind of a, like an Episcopalian upbringing, which is typical because it's a dead church. They don't believe in the Bible anymore. They don't believe that the Holy Spirit's actually real doing things like the way the Bible teaches. And so why would you go to church? There's no reason. And so she left that. She goes to Tim Keller's church and she adopts this evangelicalism because she, of course, there's a spiritual void that she has and she wants to, to be fulfilled spiritually. And then she starts realizing, hey, um, evangelicals kind of are pro-life. <laughs> they kind of think that marriage should be reserved for men and women. Um, they believe in male headship. And of course, she's at a church where I would say those things are all very watered down, to say the least. But she starts realizing that as a, a an active member of the Democratic Party, that at least they're not quite to the left of, a, they're, they're not to where she is. And so she rejects it. And now she's, you know, in this more activist version of spirituality that she's kind of made herself where she follows MLK and Malcolm X and kind of whatever fits her fancy. But um, but but that's part of the problem with, I, I think, what's been happening. You, you have pastors adopting social justice rhetoric, whether it's from Black Lives Matter, Me Too, or e even like um, things like environmental justice. They'll, they'll take these things. They'll try to fuse them with Christianity somehow, whether that's corrupting the gospel by adding some kind of a requirement to have the whole gospel. You need to do some kind of a social justice thing or it's um, just perverting Christian ethics or um, playing around like Tim Keller would play around with things like even the Trinity. Uh, to, to, he, he had the social Trinity idea that, um, you know, it, it really just, um, I suppose, for people who don't like hierarchy and people who uh, don't like a God of wrath, uh, to think that God is just love and that's his essence, uh, which is what Tim Keller taught pretty much. That was the core thing, uh, not holiness, but love. And, and that each member uh, of the Trinity is doing this love dance. I, mean, I kid you not, this is what he talks about. You know, you're starting to tamper now with like fundamental Christian doctrines and you're doing it to, to be socially palatable to left-leaning people in blue cities. Um, and, and in so doing your, your, really invading or or yeah invading is the right word i suppose your own people with ideas that undermine the very faith they believe and so um yeah i mean hopefully that that uh, explains what you're did i answer your question i hope I did. you did so there, there are two things right which is first i want to go back to what you just said 
that on its surface, right? You could be forgiven for saying, well, what's, what's the problem with that? You know, that seems like a, you know, a bit of a flowery language, but why is that term? I believe you use the love dance. Like, why does that matter outside of just a, a way to describe the Christian Trinity? Yeah. on that issue specifically, I mean, that's not one of the major issues I would say. I was just using that as one example, but, but on that issue, um, uh, so, so you're asking what the problem with that is. The problem is that it takes one attribute, love, and it makes it the only thing that really matters. And so people want a God of love and not a God of wrath, right? Because they want to feel accepted. I think they want a more maternal God rather than a paternal God. Um, all things male are under attack. So if you can sort of fit God into this image that people are already looking for in blue cities, you know, young millennials and Gen Zers especially, uh, then you might be able to attract them. And so the whole goal becomes to, to um, convince them that when they come to church, they're not coming to their grandfather's church. It's not a traditional kind of church, um, but they can still be spiritual. They can still have that aspect of them since we all have that fulfilled in a way and they can keep their politics too. And so, um, so, so that's just one example, the social Trinitarian view, at least Tim Keller's version of that, where they, there's a, a, a doctrine of um uh, that's frankly mysterious in the christian faith but these uh, co-equal and eternal um this this being that's in three persons and and tim keller uh takes that and he tries to make it a love dance where the the, the son is always glorifying the father the father's trying to like uh put shine the light on the son and the, the holy spirit's you know mixed in there somewhere and they're all like trying to um to, to honor each other and that and, and what he says is that as created beings as humans you're not really fulfilled until you become part of that dance as well which of course there's no biblical reference to back up any of this it's all built on his theology uh but it it sounds really flowery when when he describes it because it's um it's it, it, he's saying there's this beautiful dance that's going on it's the dance of creation it's um the source of our our entire existence and we can be part of it if we come to Christ. And, and that's part of the benefit uh, is we're going to be spiritually fulfilled. We're going to be part of this dance, too. Um, and so, you know, it it's like, you know, could you find like a heresy in that where it's like this directly refutes the, the Trinity? I mean, I, I suppose you could in, in a step or two. It's not maybe directly heretical. Maybe it is, actually. I mean, it's it, but it's not like... Um, some of the ancient heresies concerning the Trinity. It's it's a it's an emphasis. It's a spin on the Trinity. It's a description of the Trinity, but it's certainly not a biblical understanding of it. Augustine wouldn't have accepted this as a, even though he had many analogies for the Trinity. This would not have been one he would have accepted. Um, so. so I'm going to and thank you for answering that. That was sure. a, sort of a digression. I was just curious on you know your specifics there. So one of the things that could be could be said right because obviously i i've grown up in evangelical america and even if i'm not necessarily close to you know what's happening at every level i, I these are my people right I, I know this culture is that you could there's a a line of reasoning which basically goes this what you're talking about social justice well that's just politics right and here at you know xyz church we're about you know, the gospel. So why do these social justice topics matter to Christianity? What, what would be your response to that objection? Yeah. And that's a very typical evangelical thing to say that we're just about the gospel. We're gospel centered this, everything's gospel. And um, I would like to suggest that's actually fairly new in church history to make everything the God, the gospels, it, obviously their central message is, is very important. Um, but it gets ridiculous. People, people are, are are putting everything into the gospel, and, and of course, it waters down the gospel. It corrupts the gospel. It, um, and so, when you have an evangelical church that um, generally they're, they're more biblicist in the sense that they uh, they they tend to have this blank slate approach to scripture. Not all evangelical churches are like this, but there is this tendency, especially in more fundamentalist influenced evangelical uh, churches, to um, kind of look at scripture as this, uh, as this, this doc, this, this, this series of documents that is, is obviously inspired by God. 
um, infallible and and we can ascertain its meaning in the present day without the help of tradition, um, without, uh, we, we don't really need to know church history. Um, in fact, a lot of the seminaries uh, now, they, they don't even teach um, church history, or at least they don't teach, uh, they don't require it as many semesters as they used to and so forth. So, um, so all that to say, I know I, I'm leading up to your question here, but um, I have, I, I think that a lot of these evangelical churches are kind of ripe for a political movement like the social justice movement. And, and I've argued that it's actually, it's a political religious movement. Sure, it's political, but um, they have their own priests, really. They're their own, uh, their own infallible books that you can't question and their own infallible perspectives that you're not allowed to challenge. So like, for, for example, black voices or, uh, you know, women's, uh, women speaking on women's issues. If you're a man, you're not allowed to um, talk about abortion, for example. So they, they have these perspectives that you cannot challenge because they're sacred. Um, and they also have, uh, through the university system and through their activism, they, they have corporate meetings that function as really spiritual gatherings. In fact, some of the reporters, one of them, Michael Tracy, I remember back in 2020 said, look, all these George Floyd protests I go to, they look like evangelical worship services. And, uh, and, and, and you could also point out, um, that they have their own kind of alternative gospel where you can being born again is, is basically their parallels getting woke. Uh, and when you're a new person, when that happens, and then your goal is to give up your privilege and to convince others to give up theirs. Sometimes you have to force that. Uh, so you become an activist, which is like their form of evangelism. And then their heaven is, is a heaven on earth where eventually we're going to be, have a society of equity, diversity, and inclusion. So you can see th th there's these power, th th these parallels. Like, there's a cosmic struggle between the haves and the have nots. There's, there's all these things that sound very Christian. And, and it's because it's Christian societies that have largely, when they secularized, um, come up with these ideas. And when Christians hear them, th there is something somewhat familiar. But I think because, um, and I'm not blaming biblicism for this, like, uh, uh, like I'm not saying like if you value the Bible too much and you, and you don't value tradition at all, you're going to wind up like this. That's not the case. But I do think there was a little bit of a, a weakness in that some of the issues, like issues of like Gnosticism, for example, um, which I see very much prevalent with the standpoint epistemology of, of the social justice movement, th these have already been discussed in church history. But I think a lot of evangelicals just aren't aware of that. And so when these ideas come knocking on their door, they give them a, a, a an, like a peripheral overview and they think, oh, it sounds similar to what we've been saying. Uh, and and they see the parallels. And so they'll adopt aspects of it and they'll say, well, we we're not going to accept maybe the, the radical LGBT stuff of the BLM movement. But of course, we will accept uh, the racial uh, components of it. And um, and so they just they, they were left kind of open to it already. And um, they didn't have courageous leaders willing to come in and say, hey, hold on. Some of this stuff has already been talked about, decided we've lived through this. This is an iteration of, of a previous battles that have been fought in church history. Um, and so they just thought it's a new political movement. It's about justice. Let's join it. That sounds Christian. So, and I think that you're, you're right in identifying kind of that, that weakness to this rhetoric. And I'm sure that there are some people, you know, many of whom I've met that would basically say, all right, there it is. That shows us, right. That Christianity is unable to meet this sort of challenge and specifically kind of, uh, shall we say like low church Protestantism is unable to meet that challenge. You know, this is, this shows that, you know, that, you know, evangelicalism is inherently flawed. It has no kind of way to address this. Do you think that that criticism is accurate or is it sort of missing the missing something? Well, evangelicalism suffers from what most institutions in society affected by modernity are suffering from. It's not like, they're the only people that are leaderless and have corrupt uh, the ones, the leaders they do have are corrupt. I mean, we saw this with the medical establishment. Obviously our political establishment is similar. There's a mixture of incompetence and evil in the, in the upper echelons. Uh, in fact, you don't make it through the ranks unless you have one of those <laughs> features. Uh, you can see it in our education in Hollywood, you know, it, it's pretty much everywhere. Um, and there's a disconnect between the people in the pews generally 
and uh, the people at the top. And so I think when this came knocking on the doors of churches, there were certainly uh, the, the people who didn't have discernment, who adopted these things and just thought, hey, because because a lot of the, the social justice activists in churches could quote their Bible verses. So so it sounds good. They speak the evangelical language, which sometimes is all it takes. But we know same thing with Republicans in general. You you, you put on a brand new uh, hunting outfit and shoot a shotgun in a promo, even though even if you've never hunted in your life and you're a Second Amendment champion. I mean, we, for some reason, we just we I guess we're desperate for heroes and we just accept that. And Christians are, are, are similar, I think. They're just very gracious people. They assume the best. And if you're speaking their language and you come to them with something that sounds like it could be Christian, they're, they're just going to assume it. And the leaders weren't keeping guard of wolves uh, that were actually coming in and ravaging the sheep. And so um, there were sheep, there were people in these congregations who did stand up. There were a lot of church splits. There were a lot of um, uh, people who realized this is a bad political movement. We can't adopt this. Maybe they couldn't even articulate anything beyond that. They just knew this was Marxist somehow. And they did not get back up from their pastors uh, in many cases. And so I still think there's a large group of evangelicals out there who they don't go along with any of this. They don't like it. They, they are against all the changes that have happened, but they're not they don't have influence in their denominations or their organizations. Um, so so your question is, is evangelicalism able to meet the challenge? Well, I mean. I, I suppose it has in certain respects. You could, I could point out individual churches where it has. I could point out um, even some institutions where they've uh, they've tried to put up barriers to social justice thinking. Um, but I, I don't see anything special or or inherently weaker about evangelicalism as opposed to any other religious body, really, or any other um, uh, organization. Um, and, and in fact, I'll, I'll, you probably have members in the audience, I would assume who are Eastern Orthodox, cause that's kind of like a new thing for, uh, people who are disaffected evangelicals to go join the Eastern Orthodox church. And, um, I, and I have a good friend in, who's, uh, in Eastern Orthodoxy. In fact, she's, um, busy setting up a, uh, I guess kind of like a, I don't know, a denomination. I, I don't know how they, they, they phrase it in Eastern Orthodoxy, but, but a, a, a section of the church that's geared towards southerners in particular and but anyway i was talking to her about this and and i i said you know a lot of these uh traditional evangelicals are saying it, it the orthodox church is the answer uh and they um they have the rich theology that's able to kind of stand against this and she said to me uh no it's in the eastern orthodox church too because i knew it was in the roman catholic church she goes no it's in the eastern orthodox church it's definitely there at the higher levels and then that's where the pressure from the media is so I don't know, like, will, will having like a, a, a broader sense of tradition and identity help you? I think it will. I think that's why there's some evangelicals who are attracted to that kind of thing. Um, but at the same time, you can't ever escape it, really. It, it seems to be a matter of, of corruption, too. Just leaders who want to ingratiate themselves to the powers in the world, and they don't want to be on the hit list. And that's understandable. The government is very powerful. And if they target you, you're in trouble. So if they can convince the government they're not a threat, I, I think that's a huge part of this as well. Um, so it, it's a complicated, uh, really, recipe here for um, challenging it and coming up with, I was presenting for, to some Lutherans two weeks ago on um, how do you guard against this? It's it's challenging. It's complicated. Um, I think, though, if there's one ingredient above all the others, it's courageous leadership. If you just have someone, someone that understands some basic theology, some basic church history, can see what this is, and is willing to say something, that's what we've been lacking. We don't have leaders who are willing to say it. They're afraid they're going to be called racist or sexist or something. Uh, so that's where we're at. So one of the the things that I think that you're you're spot on is is this. And look, my my oftentimes co-host, you know, George Bagby, who I have a great deal of affection for, he's Eastern Orthodox. You know, I, I love his family. I've been to church with him. So this is not a, a personal dig. But I do think that there is a, a benefit to obscurity in the sense that a large part of the reason that at least in the U.S. that there isn't as much social justice, you know, in at least visible orthodoxy is the fact that there, until very recently, uh, no one really knew about them. You know, there just weren't that many of them. They were kind of off doing their own thing. And so obviously, right, the, the first places to kind of get hit by social ide justice ideology are those closest to the centers of power, right? Like we saw this hit 
Catholicism. We saw this hit mainline Protestantism well before it got here. You know, and I would argue that a large part of that has to do with, you know, proximity to power. And, yeah. and so you've mentioned several times the the crisis of leadership in, in this community. So when do you when do you see that stemming from? Like when did that occur? I assume it's obviously not always been the case or else this, you know, community never really would have formed to begin with. But when would yeah. you say this is when, you know, we lost leadership? Yeah. Um, and one thing, also a little rabbit trail about Eastern Orthodoxy. I know that's not why I'm being interviewed, but I do remember I was looking it up, but I couldn't find it. There was a stat uh, where they were polling different religious groups on support for abortion and support for homosexuality and these kinds of things. And uh, I remember looking at it and, th and Eastern Orthodoxy was way more to the left uh, than evangelicalism. And so it um, doesn't mean I, all the churches are like that, but um, it, 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 yeah, it's just interesting. I don't know how they how they conducted the poll, but um, yeah, I don't see a denomination or a religion that has escaped this is my really my main point. Uh, as far as the leadership crisis is concerned, um, man, I think we've had a crisis for a long time and probably not known it. We've had cancer, but the doctor didn't diagnose it until like 2020. For most people, they didn't get the report saying they had cancer. And then they realized it was actually like stage four cancer. Um, so... Yeah, I mean, I'm trying to think like if you go back to like the 1980s, um, you saw the World War II generation was very more willing to be aggressive on things. Uh, and, and maybe it's because they fought in World War II. But you think of like what happened in the Missouri Synod where you had the battle for the Bible. You think about um, what happened in the Southern Baptist Convention during a course of like a 10 year period. The conservatives took back the convention from some rank um, really just heretics. And, uh, it was led by some courageous men, Paige Patterson, Adrian Rogers, Charles Stanley. Um, some of these guys were willing to call a spade a spade. They were willing to sacrifice. It wasn't about their institution. Uh, there's some, there's a, there is a generational disconnect though, between the greatest generation and the baby boomers. The baby boomers seem to want to hold on to control in organizations for as long as they possibly can. Uh, they seem to want to, they, they're very like uh, managerial in that like th their organization means so much to them and they're willing to sacrifice people sometimes to their organization and, and causes for their organization. And um, I don't know exactly what that is. I'm sure smarter people have written on this, but um, you look at even a lot of the main ministries that are still around, um, like, uh, like, like grace to you. I was just talking to someone from, uh, John MacArthur's church earlier today, where you look at like RC Sproul's ministry and like when those, when he died and when John MacArthur dies, like who's going to take it over, right? It's not going to be any one of his status or his stature. Uh, it's it, and Ligonier still has conferences. So it's RC Sproul's ministry, but, um, it's not the same. It's, it's the people under him are not, they do not fill his shoes at all. And, and so the question is, I guess, what caliber of a leader, what, what's the, um, what, why this disconnect and why, why are the leaders so bent on avoiding conflict, making sure their organization is successful? Uh, it has something to do with the baby boomer generation, I suspect, because it's not just in the church, it's in other institutions as well. They respond to pressure when sometimes when it hurts their wallets or when it, you know, they're going to see a big mutiny on their hands, they might respond to pressure. But otherwise, um, if they if they can have smooth sailing and uh, and I'm not, by the way, I should just say I love John MacArthur. So I'm not saying John MacArthur is part of necessarily this critique, but um, or R.C. Sproul. But um, I, I think there's tendencies that some of these these guys have to. Or build organizations and then the people around them are part of an industry that's developed around them. And so they're, they're managerial elites, like Sam Francis talks about they're, um, they, they couldn't have built the organization themselves. Most of the time they're there to maintain an already built organization. And so if that's your only goal is to make sure the organization continues, uh, and you all have, you know, a, a job, a, a paycheck coming to you, if you're, if you work in one of these organizations, you, you won't question, you won't uh, make any waves. Um, and I think it just rewards cowardice uh, because it's the people who tend to ingratiate themselves to leaders 
in these organizations that rise in the ranks. It, it's through flattery. I've seen this firsthand at, a, at just about every evangelical institution I've been to. Uh, flattery gets you very far. And, um, and, and it shouldn't. We need a different leadership model, but uh, we, we're stuck with uh, managers, um, academics, and activists. And we need shepherds. We need to get back to the biblical. The, the shepherds are strong. Shepherds are, can be violent when they're defending their sheep. Uh, they will kill wolves. Um, they, are, they guard uh, the sheep. Uh, they will sacrifice their own life, right? Th this is the shepherd model we see in scripture for leadership. And, and that's not what we have. We don't have people that are willing to make those sacrifices. So I'm curious if we, if we could for a minute, could we examine kind of a, a, a negative example, right? Of perhaps, you know, a group of Christians who is essentially kind of drank the Kool-Aid, so to speak, because one of the things that kind of continually goes around as a way to kind of make people angry. You know, it'll be some, you know, mainline Protestant leader from the Northeast, you know, normally <laughs> kind of a, a middle-aged uh, overweight woman, you know, saying <laughs> right. something, you know, inflammatory, equating, you know, Christian doctrine with some point of kind of political progressivism, right? right. You know, really... Jesus would, and then, you know, listing off a series of, you know, essentially democratic party uh, platitudes. Right. So if you could, could you think of kind of a, a more specific example of essentially what happens when, you know, you, you kind of give it, you know, when you, you let them in the door, so to speak. Yeah. And, and you're spot on with the, the stereotype of the, the Northeastern pastor there. Cause I, I live down the street from a number of churches like that. And they, um, you'll have a, you know, an LGBT flag or trans flag or whatever it is now. And, um, and then on the other side, like Ukrainian flag, you won't even see the United States flag anywhere. Uh, but yeah, I mean, they're, they're obviously like way to the left. They've, they've capitulated in total. They, they just have a different religion. It doesn't even resemble Christianity anymore. Uh, and it's very sad. Um, a lot of like the, a lot of mainline churches end up going this direction. And, um, as for evangelical churches that have started, like I, Evangelical churches generally aren't going to go that far. I mean, as soon as they go that far, they're not evangelical anymore. But like uh, churches that were evangelical, um, it, it, it tends to be more of a gradual thing. Like, for example, instead of uh, in, instead of saying homosexual marriage is legitimate, because once you get there, you're going to question all kinds of other doctrines that are really fundamental to being an evangelical. Uh, they'll say things like, um, well, same sex attraction is not a sin homosexual uh, actions are but not not feelings it'll be something like that so it's a soft peddling it's a, it's creating a a place for people who are homosexual in your congregation it's this halfway measure that's an attempt to try to hold on to doctrine while also getting involved with these political movements social movements uh so yeah a good example like a con there's there's tons of concrete examples of this i suppose um but, you know, I would say I mean, we, we talked about Tim Keller before we could use like his church and the Gospel Coalition, which he co-founded also um, as examples of this, where um, if you go back 15, 20 years, most of the content on the Gospel Coalition website is going to be geared more toward uh, reform theology. And um, there's not going to be much in the way of politics. Uh, and then, of course, you, you find during the I think it was like the Freddie Gray uh, shooting and, and, uh, I, I forget, I get them mixed up sometimes, but, um, the, the Ferguson, Missouri, uh, event, uh, those events sparked something that changed the way that an organization like gospel coalition looked at political issues. And they started, uh, talking about this more. They started, um, talking about really, really now what we know as critical race theory, uh, ideas. And of course they did it in, in flowery language. They would say things like, where this is about racial reconciliation. In fact, when I was at seminary, I was at Southeastern, which is a Southern Baptist school um, in 2014. Um, I started hearing all this language about racial, re racial reconciliation. And it was, it hadn't taken over the campus or anything. It was just kind of like it, it was introduced. People just started talking about it. We had a lot of uh, people who weren't even Southern Baptists coming to chapel who were speaking about the African-American experience. It made no sense to me because I was there to learn the Bible. My roommates, you know, were there to learn the Bible, but um, but we were getting, you know, heavy doses of this stuff. And then of course, after Donald Trump was elected, I mean, it just went 
we found out what racial reconciliation really meant. It was uh, to, if you're white, to give up all your privilege, to redistribute your income in some way, to, um, uh, to to kind of like give up your positions, your your power, influence, and give those to minorities. That's what it really meant. It was a redistribution scheme, and um, but it wasn't on the front end. It wasn't really like brought to us that way. It sounded good. It sounded like oh yeah, like of course especially in the South. Uh, we know that there's been animosity in the past between these groups of people and yeah, Christianity should be able to bridge that gap. And, and that's, I think a lot of what well-intentioned people thought was going on. And then of course it became so much more than that. Um, you have to give up all your monuments and your symbols and, and all of that. And so, um, so I think that, uh, I'm trying to remember now your question because I think I got away from it. Did I answer it or or did I, have I not hit it yet? No, I, I think you did. So one of the things that has been of of interest to me recently is the hand wringing around uh, quote unquote Christian nationalism. And a, a friend of mine, Stephen Carson, he he sent an article to me and a group of other people written written by murray rothbart in the 70s murray rothbart an atheist jew uh one of the founding uh kind of like luminaries in in libertarianism wrote right. this article i believe in the mid 70s it might have been the 90s i cannot remember but point is he was writing about the hand the hand wringing about you know what then would have been you know the moral majority right uh, very similar people kind of your and my grandparents or parents even and what's especially interesting is that except for the terminology, right, Christian nationalism in our own context, the critiques were effectively the same. You know, these people want to take us back to a theocracy. You right. know, they want, you know, women in chains. They want some sort of like, you know, Southern Baptist Taliban. Uh, and <laughs> yeah. I, I'm, I'm sort of joking there, right? But there is a lot of, shall we say, regime pressure against Christian nationalism. So two-part question for you. Could you describe or define what kind of your average, you know, NPR listener would think Christian nationalism is, and then maybe compare that to what you see that, you know, on the ground, what that term actually means? Uh, yeah, sure. So I think there are parallels between the religious right and Christian nationalism. I would say the main difference is this. The religious right was really about Christian values, and it was in a context when the United States was still, I guess a, you could say a Christian country in the sense that um, most of the people knew what Christianity was and respected it and thought, and they already conceived of themselves as Christians, okay? That's the, that's the key thing here. Now, people do not conceive of themselves as a Christian country. Even if they're Christians in this country, they don't think of themselves as Christians as part of a Christian country. So there's an identity issue here. And so Christian nationalism is sure it's about Christian values, but it's about more than that. It's about, uh, seeing oneself as part of a Christian, uh, nation or Christian country. And, and so, um, th there's that, what was assumed in the 1980s now has to be fought for. And so I, I think that the NPR types who are, um, really a concern about Christian nationalism think, as you said, it's going to be a theocracy. It's people who aren't Christians are going to be forcibly converted or punished or jailed or something. And if Christians gain power, they're going to take away all our rights, uh, our civil rights. And, and so that's a scary boogeyman. And of course, nationalism is often linked to the uh, Nazis and it's, uh, you know, it has these parallels, these dark parallels in history. Um, but yeah, in actuality, I think, what we're seeing develop is more of just at least the common thread between everyone who's written on this seems to be a recognition that we there, there is no neutrality as far as like you you can't have a principled pluralist country that's going to respect Christians. Uh, they're going to end up being religious in some sense. The question is what religion? And we're in a transition between Christianity and paganism. And in that in between is this secularism. And that secularism is only a holding. Uh, spot. It, it can't last. And so the Christian nationalists are saying our identity, our, uh, the, the source of our laws, the um, way that we treat each other, the way we think of ourselves needs to all be Christian. And, and they're also saying with the fracturing going on, 
this is the only glue that can keep us together in a, such a multicultural society. If we can at least have one thing that we share in common, that being Christianity, which I think the polls are still in the 70s percentiles, you know, that you have people claiming to be some form of Christianity, um, then then perhaps we can uh, have some stability. So I, I think they're actually making a very good point. I think that um, it's not NPR types are not giving it a fair treatment. They're not even really fairly interacting with any of the material that's presented, whether it's Andrew Torber or Stephen Wolf. Uh, they're just going with some stereotype and then uh, condemning it and trying to find, uh, cherry pick the historical record to find bad examples of where religious people were tyrannical or something and saying, well, that's that's what they're doing. It, it, it's lazy. It's not academic. It's, it's, it's frankly just embarrassing, but um, that's what we have. So. So that, that brings up a, an interesting, an interesting point, right? Which is this idea of the separation of church and state. So you've said, right, which is something that I would largely agree with, right? That, that neutrality is a myth. You know, there is no such thing as, you know, a, a neutral secular institution, right? That's at best a holding pattern. And so I'm curious, how do you make peace between, you know, that belief that in kind of inherent Christianness and then also being, I, mean, I won't say you because I don't know what you think of this, but being, you know, part of communities that by all likelihood like the American founding documents a lot. You know, like if you talk to red state Americans, if you talk to American evangelicals, yeah. Their opinions on you know the founding fathers and the Constitution tends to be a lot higher than almost anyone else, sure. and you can almost say right that that kind of uh, that idea right that there is no such thing as neutrality is sort of a an anti I won't say anti democratic but a sort of reactionary idea right it's an idea from another era. Yeah, so how would you kind of marry those two things together, or even a, maybe a more simple way to phrase the question is how would you express that idea to someone who, you know, loves the constitution, loves, you know, the bill of rights, something like that. So, so how would I express what I just described in, as far as Christian nationalism is concerned? To yes. Like to an audience who's perhaps, you know, more enamored with, you know, kind of the, the myths of America, right. This kind of idea of, Boomer you know, cons. Yes, boomer cons. Yeah, thank <laughs> okay. you. That's that's probably the best way to describe okay. it. Okay. Uh, yeah. It, so boomer cons uh, tend to, um, I mean, there's they're split, but most of them. So, so what I've noticed is a lot of the boomer cons think they understand what Christian nationalism is, and they think it's a the ones who are supportive of it. They think it's just Christian values, pretty much. Um, and I could definitely name names. I'm I'm debating whether I should, <laughs> but. There are some prominent, we'll say, voices in evangelicalism who, uh, the, the more prominent ones who are, are able to, they'll take the word Christian nationalist and attribute it to themselves. They, I don't know that they understand exactly what's going on sometimes. I think they think it's kind of like the 1980s again, and and, and there are parallels there. Um, so, so, of course, our Constitution uh, and our Declaration of Independence and, and our other founding documents um, all in were formed by people who had a Christian understanding of reality and uh, they they brought their Christian understandings with them into those documents and so so they kind of assume that and and so they want to get back to uh, valuing the the source of uh, the moral authority for these documents and that's really what they think of Christian nationalism it's a values thing again um, but the identity thing I think is really what makes Christian nationalism different than the 1980s uh, we, we have to today, if we're going to assert any kind of Christian political uh, power or domination or whatever, it, you have to recognize that you're Christian first and not a secular. It, it's not just about infusing a secular system with Christian values. It's about um, reclaiming the entire system or starting a new system that is fundamentally uh, identifiably Christian. And that's the difference. And so um, the, the other side of it, you know, the boomer cons who don't like Christian nationalism, they, they seem to pick up on this, uh, this kind of anti-neutrality bent that Christian nationalists have. And because they, they're committed to neutrality, they're committed to, um, the liberal order and the post-World War II consensus. And, and so they don't want, uh, people thinking of themselves, uh, 
to like when they talk about themselves being Americans, they're talking about an idea. They're talking about equality. They're talking about an image of red, white and blue and, you know, Trump on with his guns and an eagle or something. But they're not they're not thinking of like Anglo Protestantism needs to speak English necessarily he needs to, um, to to value some of these traditions from common law and from Anglo Protestant theology that they're not thinking that. You know, they're thinking like this is a this is a place it's, it, Muslims can be this way and atheists can, can share in this and everyone can. But wouldn't it be good if we had Christian values? In fact, I'll, I'll name one name here. Mark David Hall, in his critiques of Christian nationalism, often makes the claim that, hey, we want Christian values in our society because it's good for everyone. Right. That's a very boomer con way, I would say. of approach. And I love Mark David Hall, but but it but it's that's the um, and, and I think he's fairly actually uh, receptive to it. But but that's how he views it. And, and of course, there's people like I'll, I'll say another name. Doc Sandlin is another guy from like the Ezra Institute who just rips Christian nationalism, a new one, because it's uh, language. Basically, what it comes down to is like culture and language and ethnicity and all the things that confer identity shouldn't really matter. The only thing that matters is religion. That's the only thing that could should confer identity. So that that gives him this kind of proposition nation um this this neutral order that everyone can participate in and he can also keep his christianity and um at least that's how i see it and so um it, it, it's a challenge to help these guys understand that look we're trying to recover what was assumed the founders would have all assumed of course we're a christian country what are you what are you talking about right of course, the Treaty of Tripoli is brought up, but that's that's people who don't understand what was going on there. But um, but but our other founding documents assume this. Even the oath of office in the Constitution, right, is uh, assumes this this uh, English common law tradition of putting your hand on the Bible because there's going to be rewards and punishments after you die. And and they just they they, they would not have thought of there were, there was no other order really for them to choose from. It was a Christian order. There was different flavors of denominations in different states. Some of them had official churches, but they wouldn't have um, they, they wouldn't have looked at that and said this is a, a neutral secular thing. And in fact, they wouldn't have even thought of themselves as enlightened. We look back now and some people say, oh, yeah, that was the enlightenment. But but in their day, in their time, they just um, they came from a world where, of course, it was Christian. Of course, we value the Bible. Of course, we think of ourselves as Christians. That's all gone. So Christian nationalists are trying to say we, sh we should once again think of ourselves that way again. And so I think once uh, a boomer con understands this, it, it's really going to depend. I mean, they can go with these one of two directions. They can, they can embrace it um, sometimes without understanding it completely, uh, or they can reject it because it's against the post-World War II consensus and the proposition nation. Um, or, uh, you know, they can, they, they can rightly see that, yeah, our founders were self-consciously Christian. And that's what we need to get back to. And we need a Christian order that privileges Christianity, uh, that does not privilege other religions in the same way. And that's, that's a good thing. That's okay. Um, obviously that's, that's not the world we live in right now, but, um, and it's not even the world they grew up in. I think that's the part, hard thing for boomer cons. Like the world they grew up in is, is, is very different. Uh, they, they grew up in a world where Christians dominated, but there was like they weren't like really privileged i would say um i mean in some areas they were but they they weren't you know everyone had the same civil access to things civil rights i guess for lack of a better term they had um you know at the town hall or whatever on a on a ceremonial day you could let the uh the jewish rabbi come in and give the invocation christian nationalists are saying that's not permissible no we're not going to have imams giving invocations we're we're going to have christians uh, give invocations at events. We're going to have Christmas trees. We're not going to have um, menorahs. We're not going to have uh, displays of, of other religions. We're going to have in God we trust in the courtroom. We're going to swear uh, allegiance on the Bible, not on other quote unquote holy books. So, so these are the kinds of things that I think the boomer cons, they, they didn't grow up that way. They grew up. Yeah. Of course, most people, it, their preference was because they were Christians, they're going to swear on a Bible, but wasn't necessary, necessary. And hypothetically, I mean, if it was a Muslim being elected, you could have the Muslim, you know. So, so, so I think that's where it comes down. Like, like, like it, even in something like a noise ordinance, are church bells going to be allowed? Sure. Are Muslim mosques giving the call to prayer going to be allowed? No, not in a Christian nationalist community. 
Uh, but I think some boomer cons are going to have a problem with that. They're going to think that's against what their interpretation of, you know, the constitution is or the bill of rights. Uh, of course I, I would dispute their interpretation really. Uh, I, I don't think they, I, I think we have a, a cartoonish version of those things that is now used to justify the current liberal, liberal order. And it's not fair to what the founders actually thought about these things. Well, well, fair enough, John, and we're coming up on time. So if someone wants to find more of your work, what's a good place for them to, to do so? Uh, they can go to johnharrispodcast.com. My social media links are all there. Um, I'm on pretty much all the social media websites, Gab and Facebook and Twitter and Signal and all that. So they can go there. Yeah. Well, great. And and like I said, I've started listening to your podcast a, a few weeks ago in, in preparation for this episode, and I've, I've, I've quite enjoyed it. So that gets an endorse from me. Oh, good. And as far as my stuff, you know, you guys know where to find me. This show is available on Apple, Spotify, YouTube, you know, anywhere you listen to podcasts. Uh, I will be at the, actually, never mind. I was going to say I was going to be at the event in Nashville, but it turns out this is going to go up after that event. So if I got to see you, I'm glad I got to meet you. And uh, anyway, guys, uh, more guests is coming up soon. Uh, the, the podcast is, you know, kind of on the new schedule. Uh this is a pre-recorded episode. If you want to get pre-recorded episodes when they're recorded, obviously, and not when they hit the main feed, you can support me at the uh, link in description. I do not expect it, but I do appreciate it just to cover the cost of the show. And again, John, thank you so much for your time. My pleasure. Thanks, Jay. And to everyone at home, remember, keep your head up. The lie can't last forever. Good night.